All right, thank you. Uh, really appreciate you guys hosting me here. Um, Orbital Insight, we take the satellite imagery of Earth as well as other sources of remote sensing data and do big data analytics at an unprecedented scale. And so in 15 minutes, I'm going to attempt to talk about why this is so significant for society. And uh, hopefully maybe some of your businesses and there's opportunities to work together. Um, just for some framing context here is the satell commercial satellites have been around for a couple of decades, but it's undergoing a sea change in the industry in terms of moving from what on the left here is Worldview 2, a $500 million satellite that has very detailed resolution uh, at 50 centimeters per pixel into satellites that fit in your hand on the right there, which are Planet Lab satellites. $500 million for one satellite to a few tens of thousands of dollars thanks to the microchip revolution and the components and cell phones. In the middle is Skybox, size of about a, a mini fridge, which was acquired by Google last year. And so these guys, instead of launching one, they'll launch Constellation. Skybox is launching Constellation next year of about 10. They already have two orbiting and taking active commercial imagery. Plant Labs already has 20 in orbit. They have a little lower resolution, but they have more of them. And they're preparing next year to launch another 100 satellites. To ultimately, this will be the first instance uh, Planet Labs by 2017 of what I call persistent surveillance from space of Earth. Um, that means a, re a photo every single day of every single spot on the planet at five meter resolution. But it's only gonna get better from there. It's gonna get down to, ultimately I believe in 10 years we're gonna have one meter resolution imagery continuously from space in video. We're gonna be watching everything. So when you have that amount of massive data, you need to process that at scale. You don't have enough human eyeballs to look at all the pixels, which is the traditional way of looking at imagery. And that's why we started Orbital Insight, is to have the computers look at the pixels, right? This flood of data. So why are we here at an Internet of Things conference? Well, really you can think of the bigger picture of, you know, we are sensoritizing the world, putting sensors on everything. You guys are all part of that. And sensors on vehicles and roadways and buildings, measuring everything. It's really exciting what's going on here. We're making the world more efficient and smarter decisions. Um, but there are uh, times where you need to make business decisions about assets you don't have physical control over. You don't have the ability to put the physical sensor on or the cost of putting all these sensors across a whole city landscape or in certain applications or hard to, hard to put places in, a, in a hostile terrains, maybe in the Arctic tundra, might be difficult. This is where remote sensing comes in. And this is what Orbital Insight does, is that piece of the larger sphere of putting sensors on everything and measuring everything about the world, the part about the remote sensing is where we're carving out our space to be the market leader in analyzing the data at scale. We call this a macroscope. I believe this will be as important for society as a microscope in terms of without that, we wouldn't have modern medicine, that invention 100 years ago. The macroscope will do the same for economists. Applied economists, policymakers, you know, Fortune 500 executives, entrepreneurs dreaming up new applications you know, that fit well with, with the other sensors that are also coming online. This is a way to look at the earth in the large, but not lose the detail. You know, there's the cliche saying of, you know, to see the forest from the trees. Well, the macroscope enables that, but also without losing the granularity of the trees themselves. So you have a precise application. In fact, people have looked at a more accurate count than ever before of all the trees in the world, and it's a few trillion. Um, so these are some of the application areas. Let me quickly run you through a few. Um, in, in a nutshell, what we do on the tech side is we take pixels, whether from satellites in space, big, small, high altitude drones, low altitude drones, airplanes, whatever, any geospatial data, tile it up, throw, apply machine vision algorithms. We use a lot of deep learning neural networks, and data science is really key to packaging it up into a commercially viable product for an end user. In this case, these is a dashboard uh, that our hedge fund customers on Wall Street use to be able to trade uh, stocks of retailers looking at the traffic patterns we observed from space prior to the companies announcing their sales to the public. So they get a heads up. Uh, we're backed by Sequoia Capital and Google Ventures, as well as Bloomberg and a few others. Um, team of folks who come from NASA, Google, Box, Amazon, um, just a, a great team of, of folks to work with every day down here in uh, Palo Alto on the peninsula. Uh-oh. Can you help me with the advance? There we go. There we go. All right, quickly, 
What does this mean in the real world? What does it look like? So this is uh, cars of 50 centimeter resolution imagery, one of, these, uh, one of our satellite partners. Stacked up images over time, we've created a heat map for an individual retail store. This is a Walmart. Now we did this for 100,000 stores across America. We ingested a million images at one time in one day in the Amazon cloud using GPUs. We counted nearly a billion cars, 700 million in the first instance. We're well over a billion now because we've been running these algorithms daily on these 100,000 stores across America. And so uh, what that allows us to do, this is the product we will sell to hedge funds on Wall Street, to customers. It is data. So we start with imagery. And in this industry, satellite imagery, the, the image was the product. No, hedge funds don't care about images. They don't even care about how many cars are in a particular Walmart store. They care about how is Walmart doing today compared to a year ago or compared to Target. Today in the news, yesterday in the news was Macy's having a horrible quarter. Investors are wondering, well, how are the rest of the retailers going to do? How's Nordstrom's going to do and JCPenney's, who reported today? And we predicted accurately in advance that actually this is not just a Macy's problem. This is all department store problems. In this case, this is Kohl's department store. And we are in the data seeing things like Black Friday, the peaks, the troughs, the seasonality, the weekly variations, Saturday peaks, even popping out in the data is that they have a senior discount day on Wednesdays. We didn't know that in advance. We looked on the website to say, why is there a Wednesday secondary peak? Well, they actually have a discount day. It pops out in the data, and that gave us confidence. We can see weather patterns affect, you know, bad weather in the Northeast, stores performing worse. What's the implications of the macro economy? Do people rebound in those sale, you know, those purchases they, they deferred and buy more, or do they just spend less overall? That has big implications for the economy. That, those are sort of numbers that the Federal Reserve is looking at for interest rates. And in this case, uh, there's a polar vortex that, uh, about two years ago, and consumers did bounce back, and overall spending smoothed out. It just was dampened for a little bit. China, completely the other example. We do more than count cars. We, people want to know how the China economy is doing. That's even harder to measure than the American economy. Uh, because the government is notorious for bad statistics. This is in the news last week. They're off by 17% of the official coal statistics, coal consumption statistics. Big implications for policy negotiations around climate change and a greenhouse gas emission global system of the United Nations. And so people don't trust the statistics from China when they're doing 17% revisions over 15 years of history of data. So we look from space. What's really going on with construction in China? If you look down an image, with your eyes, it's hard to tell really how tall that building is from just above. You don't have the right perspective. But if you look at the shadows, now you can look at trigonometry and actually estimate quite accurately the amount of new construction. When you do this city by city and across 100 cities across China, now you get a real picture of what's really going on. Well, again, government statistics, this is in blue dots here, the city of Nanjing, where the official permits for construction were over a six-year period, watching with our algorithms, we actually see three times the amount of construction spatially. And then quantifying it with the, with the um, trigonometry calculations, you see a much order of magnitude larger peak and a big crash that's not reflected in the government statistics. This is why we have customers interested in this. Oil, that's another big thing, area that people care a lot about, where are oil prices going. So we can look at the inventories. And oil is stored in steel tanks with roofs that float up and down to minimize evaporations for environmental concerns. And so that casts a shadow on the inside of the cylinder. And through that, again, trigonometry, we can see how much oil is stored on a daily basis around the world. There's an open database, public database, of where all these oil tanks are around the world, 18,000 of them. So we regularly monitor them. Algorithms, finding the shadows, measuring the shadows, trigonometry, all automated pipeline, no humans in the loop, to estimate the amount of oil. Agriculture, this is a more uh, well-known uh, technique for dealing with uh, differences in infrared band and red reflection. So plants absorb the red color band and they reflect the infrared. And there's some techniques to, that are very predictive of harvest. And so we have higher accuracy than US Department of Agriculture's forecast because we're using higher resolution imagery. And we're um, analyzing this in real time on a regular basis using that Landsat imagery. And then now we're going towards uh, five meter resolution imagery and scaling this up globally to not just corn, soy, wheat, cotton, all the world's traded commodities. Some other applications, we have uh, neural networks to detect rooftops of new homes. Uh, this is an example in Phoenix. Automatically, every time a new home gets built, we just you know, see that and kind of track the US home construction market. A project with the World Bank in Sri Lanka, could we 
um, measure poverty from space. Um, repurposing some algorithms we had for car counting, agricultural um, productivity, the building development and the, and the building height. And our partners at the World Bank are running this against measure, uh, um, census data and household survey data to see if these might be proxies because it's a lot cheaper to look with algorithms with imagery from space than to send people door to door across a whole country like Sri Lanka to try to gather that data and help the World Bank prioritize its resources as well as other NGOs. What does this all come down to? These are just some examples. I'll walk you through very quickly about seven of these. Um, our game plan over the next three years is to build 100 of these sort of products to measure all the world's ports, all the container chip traffic coming in and out, the containers built at the ports, all the piles of bulk commodities, the commodities coming out of the mine, stockpiles at coal-fired power plants, emissions from, from smokestacks, greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation. I've worked with Aaron at his last organization, World Resource Institute, project around that. We're looking at the railroads, we're looking at the highways, freight traffic, basically looking at economies in the micro and the macro and even global scale, and really bringing this to the public in, in the hopes that really transparency, this sort of radical transparency, will help us make better business decisions, help us make more humanitarian decisions, help us kind of uh, hold people accountable, who, whether it be corruption or dysfunctions in the economy or manage risks in supply chains, famine issues around agriculture. These are real weighty questions, which makes it a lot of fun for us to work on it every day. And so at this point, I'll leave it here, see if anybody has some questions. Hmm?